My brothers and sisters, today we celebrate the third Sunday of Advent, and today's theme is On Mary, a Song of Trust. Very oddly today, we do not have any shout-outs, but I'm sure by next week we'll make up for not having any shout-outs today. So now we move straight into the service proper with the lighting of the Advent wreath, the third Advent wreath, third Sunday of Advent. Today is the third Sunday in Advent. We join with the writers of the Bible in shouting for joy that God is always with us. The child of Mary brought a message of compassion and healing, the things that make for real joy. That joy spreads as we follow Jesus' words and actions. The first Advent candle reminds us to have hope for a better world. The second Advent candle reminds us that God's dreams for peace can become real in our world. Today we light the third Advent candle. It reminds us that God calls us to be part of the healing of the world to bring real joy. Let us pray, loving God, so, so many, many people, people need your, your healing and, and your hope. hope. In this, in this season of giving and, and on every day of the year, year. Help, help us to say and do those things, things that, that will help bring Christ's compassion and caring to all. Amen. Amen. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Show, Show the light, the light of, of your countenance, and we, and we shall, be, shall saved. be saved. Will you not give us life again? That your, that your people, people may rejoice, rejoice in, in you. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant, and grant us, us your salvation. salvation. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace, Peace in, in heaven and glory in the, in the highest. highest. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. you. Let us pray. God of power and mercy, you call us once again to celebrate the coming of your Son. Remove those things which hinder love of you that when he comes, he may find us waiting in awe and wonder. For him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
From the letter to the Hebrews. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words, once more, indicate the removing of what can be shaken that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The appointed Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8, and you are encouraged to join us in the refrain. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. O oh God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore, I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. The, the Lord, Lord is, is full of, of compassion, compassion and, and mercy. mercy. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall praise you, so will I bless you as long as I live and lift up my hands in your name. The Lord, the Lord is, is full of compassion, compassion and, and mercy. mercy. My soul is content as of marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate you, meditate on you in the night watches. The, the Lord, Lord is, is full of compassion, compassion and, and mercy. mercy. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. 
The Lord is full, full of compassion, compassion and, mercy. and mercy. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is a testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to, you, to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Good morning. In like fashion with Father Julian, our time this morning will take into consideration questions about the person of Mary, as well as her significance to us today. We will also look at the canticle that's, named for, that's attributed to Mary, the Magnificat. So the first question I have is who was Mary? Where did she come from? Mary was obviously the mother of Jesus, and she was probably born in Nazareth during the reign of Herod the Great. And that was between the time of 37 to 4 BC. She was part of the peasantry, which included skilled tradespeople who were faced with a triple tax burden. They had to pay a tax to Rome, to Herod the Great, and to the temple. So these were people, she comes from a people who were heavily taxed and burdened. Which leads to the next question. What was her life like? Mary would have spent the majority of her time doing housework chores, including some that were quite strenuously physical. She lived with her parents, and at the time of where we pick up her story, she lived with Joseph, and also her parents and her sisters that were not named. She was probably illiterate because women in that time were not normally educated because most of the history was orally transmitted. Another question that we have is, would she have known about the prophecy of the coming Messiah? And the answer is yes, she would have. She would have been educated, because she was a Jew, about the promised Messiah. And she would have been expected to believe that he was coming. She became a part of the fulfillment of God's ultimate plan when the angel Gabriel came to her and said that you will conceive and give birth to a son. So... Another question that comes to us is, what does her name actually mean? Mary's name was actually Miriam. Miriam is the Hebrew version of that name, while Mary is the New Testament blending of two Greek names, Miriam and Miria. 
once we look at her Hebrew name, we see an Old Testament connection. Because there was a Miriam in the Old Testament that also safeguarded a young Hebrew boy. And, of course, I'm speaking of Moses' mother. After Pharaoh had ordered that all Hebrew boys were to be thrown into the Nile, Miriam watched over her brother, where he was hidden among the reeds, and went to fetch a nurse, which turned out to be Pharaoh's daughter. Mary, with Joseph, also protected Jesus from another jealous king, Herod the Great. The meaning of Miriam and Mary is wished for child, and both women certainly cared for important children whose safety was under threat of the, of the authorities. Another question that we can explore is, was Mary foretold of in the Old Testament? As Christians, we see that God selected two young women at two different times in Scripture to protect young men, to lead Israel out of slavery from Egypt. The first one that we spoke of already was Miriam. And there was a prophecy in Isaiah 7 that foretold that a woman, such as Mary, would one day emerge to give birth to Israel's wished-for child. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. But there's more about Mary's story than just knowing about who she is and where she comes from and how she fits into the path, into the story. There's many things that oftentimes that we can't understand because of our cultural situation. So one of the more common questions that I have gotten was, how old was she? So I found this. Jewish maidens were considered to be marriageable at 12 years and 6 months, although the age of them when they were actually married varied based on circumstances. You see, the weddings were preceded by sometimes lengthy betrothals, where the bride was legally... legally belonged to the bridegroom, although they didn't actually live with them until after the wedding ceremony. So Mary was betrothed to Joseph, which was, as mentioned, legally binding in the Jewish culture. Now what was interesting is that during this betrothal, Mary would have actually lived with her parents still, not with Joseph. Another interesting question um, that, that came out was, was it shocking that she was found to be pregnant before she was actually married? Now, most biblical scholars will tell you that, well, of course, because they weren't married. But what actually could transpired quite often is that betrothed couples actually did engage in sex before they had married. And it was okay as long as it was between the, the bridegroom and the bride. So it wasn't shocking completely that she was pregnant, as long as it could have been assured that it was Joseph's child. That's where the shocking and scandalous situation arose, because she was found to be pregnant, and Joseph knew it was not his child. So that leads to another question. What are some of the consequences that could have faced Mary being found to be pregnant and not by her betrothed. So what we need to remember is that in this culture, and in this society, it was very much led and controlled by men. Women were viewed to be chattel, and to belong to their husbands, or prior to that, to their fathers. So a girl who became pregnant out of wedlock would have been terrified. Because the whole social structure was set up that children were to be born within marriage. The genealogy and ownership of children was seen to be very important. And we can see that in a couple of our in in a couple of the gospels where it is prefaced by these long genealogies. Girls who became pregnant outside of marriage would probably have been forced to leave their homes and their families. There was a potential of being sold into slavery 
or being stoned to death. She might have been married off quickly or banished from the home and village so as not to bring um, dishonor onto the family. When we keep these things in mind and we, re and we reflect on the response of Joseph, we can really see where he was responsive to the message of the angels that he not only didn't send her away, but he still married her. So once we're past the fact that um, she was pregnant, Joseph decided to keep her and to marry her anyway and to raise the, raise the son. What about after, um, during the life of Jesus? Did Mary interact with her son? So we don't know much about, Je about Mary because the gospel is Jesus' story, not hers. We might surmise that before Jesus' resurrection, she might have been a bit confused. After all, Jesus began his ministry by offending the people in the synagogue, and he continually upset the Pharisees. This was a culture where membership and belonging in one synagogue and temple was central to the way that they lived, and to be expelled from the temple or the synagogue was essentially to be cut off from your, from your community supports. She might have thought her son might have been a bit insane. We read in Mark 3, 21, that when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And then Jesus follows that, and, and he says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Now, we don't see in the Gospels any amnesty between Jesus and his family, but we do see that Jesus didn't see that blood determined who his family was. For a mother who might have believed she would hold a special place in her son's heart, some of his words might have hurt her quite a bit. But we do read later that she would treasure moments up. So the first one that we read that is that when Jesus, at the age of, I think he was about 10, when he got left behind in the temple because he was busy talking to the teachers, that she recalled that, um, that, that when he was found in the temple, obediently learning about the Father, that Jesus was obedient to his earthly father, and she treasured this up, this experience. So we might ask, did Jesus feel an affection and a love for her, for his mother? An interesting note is that Mary was the only person present with Jesus at his birth and his death. His earthly father, Joseph, presumably died because he's not mentioned in Luke's account of his childhood. And when Jesus was there on the cross, he saw his mother, and he turned to his disciple and said, Woman, here is your son. And then to his disciple, here is your mother. This definitely shows that Jesus cared very deeply and personally for his mother. She was probably close to the age of 50 at the time when she watched her eldest son die. Mary was still alive. When the new church emerged, Luke tells us that she was in the upper room in Jerusalem with the 11 remaining apostles, and we read this in Acts 1. After that time, history tells us no more about Mary, the mother of Jesus. She lived through such a wide range of emotions that a mother can face, from being found to be pregnant out of wedlock, to having to face the potential scorn and slurs that she would have heard as she proceeded through her, her pregnancy, to watching her son become a religious political leader that was going against the times, which ultimately led to his death. Memories of the young Jesus were probably quite a powerful source of comfort while she waited, and as we wait, to be with him again. So a question about the canticle, the Magnificant, so the, a question that I received was, why is it called the Magnificant? 
And it's named after the first line in Latin, which I will try to pronounce. The Magnificant Anima Mei Ad Dominum, which means my soul magnifies the Lord. I probably slaughtered that Latin. The Magnificant is sung every day at evening prayer, otherwise known as Vespers, in, all, in religious houses and churches where they do evening prayer. The text from the canticle is taken directly from the Gospel of Luke, Luke 1, 46 through 55, where it is spoken by Mary upon the, visit, uh, the occasion of visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Baptist. But is there anything that Mary might say to us today? I think there is. I think there's many things that she, her life and her testimony could say to us today. Mary teaches us about trusting, about trusting God, particularly about trusting the presence of God. For Mary, and often for us, the presence of God means a new dream, a new plan, a new life. One that we may not understand yet. One that may seem strange and impossible, that will promise discomfort as much as success. One that will most likely upend our lives. But that's what God's favor and his dynamic presence really means. It calls us out of the ordinary and into the extraordinary. It means the Savior himself comes into our lives. To Mary, it must have seemed crazy. God's plans for us may seem crazy too. It may seem what he calls us to is impossible. So, like Mary, we may ask, how will this be? Not will this really be, but how will God accomplish his purposes in our lives? God answers us the same way he answered Mary, and that is by the Holy Spirit. The angel Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You see, there is something mysterious, something beyond us in this call to be his. There is something about the, his overshadowing power that makes the impossible more than possible. And that makes the results holy. What is born from the Holy Spirit, from God's power in our lives, is holy. That life comes when we receive God's call, which is no longer ordinary. Instead, that life is holy. Your everyday, in and out, kitchen cooking, bathroom cleaning, child chasing life is holy. That is what it means to follow God, to open your life to the unexpected Christ. It means encountering him in the ordinary and finding that life has become extraordinary. It means the impossible thing is real. It means taking a step into wonder because life is now holy. So what will our answer be? Mary's answer was a resounding yes. Yes, I am the Lord's servant, she said. May it be done to me according to your word. She surrendered. She chose to be a person who wholly, fully belonged to her master. She didn't know it would lead to a manger. She didn't know it would lead to the cross. But she did know that God called her to lay down her dreams and plans in order to embrace his and she knew that there would be a cost. Will we let go of our dreams and expectations of life? Will we embrace God's instead? Every day, every hour, the call is to lay aside our plans and, and instead identify with God's household to be his servant, accept a new adventure, accept the favor of his presence, to rejoice Rejoice, because God is with us. And that changes everything. Amen.
We now make our proclamation of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. earth. I, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, Son our, our Lord. Lord. He, he was, was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Mary. He, he suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, crucified, died, and was buried. buried. He descended, he descended to, to the, the dead. dead. On, On the third day he rose again. He ascended, ascended into heaven, heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and, and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, Catholic Church, Church, the communion of saints, saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, the resurrection of, the body, of the body, and the life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Lord, as we journey through Advent, let us prepare our hearts and homes for your coming as we pray together, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your church, for all clergy and laity, as we strive to be witnesses to the life, light which is to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in this time of uncertainty, we pray for guidance for our secular leaders as they prepare for the distribution of vaccines. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. As we await the Prince of Peace, we pray for peace in a troubled world, that there may be justice for everyone and true respect for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all who are troubled, whether it be in mind, body, or estate. We pray for those whose lives have been changed forever due to the pandemic, those who are worried, those suffering from injustice, and the violence of human beings one to another. And we especially pray for the sick and those who have asked for our prayers. Be with them, Lord, and those who minister to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for those who have died, remembering their families. May they rest in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And we pray for ourselves the needs of this parish, our personal needs. And we rejoice and give you thanks for all our blessings. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Help us, Lord, to wait with awe, with hope and joyful expectation that when next you come in glory, and the world is wrapped in fear. With your mercy, you may shield us, and with words of love, draw near. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name, name thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily, daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory, and the glory forever, forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. May Almighty God, by whose will our Savior Christ came among us in great humility, sanctify you with the light of his blessing, and set you free. May he whose second coming in power and great glory we await, make you steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. May you who rejoice in the first advent of our Redeemer, at a second advent, be rewarded with unending life. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. 
go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Walking round. 